Gospel according to St. Mark, the second chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Now when Jesus returned from Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. So many gathered around that there was no longer any room for them, not even in front of the door. And Jesus was speaking the word to them. Then some people came, bringing to Jesus a man who was paralyzed, carried by four of them. And when they could not bring him to Jesus on account of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And after having dug through they let down the mat in which the man who was paralyzed laid. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man who was paralyzed, Child, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting around questioning in their hearts, Why does this fellow speak this way? It is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? At once Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were discussing these things among themselves. And he said to them, why do questions arise in your heart? What is easier to say to the one who is paralyzed? Your sins are forgiven? Or get up, stand up, take your mat, and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Humanity has authority on earth to forgive sins. And he said to the one who was paralyzed, Stand up, take your mat, and go to your home. And immediately he stood up, took his mat, and went out before all of them, so that all of them were amazed and glorified God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. I am looking forward to this assembly being over. <laughs> Because then I won't be a new bishop. <laughs> but as a new bishop, I am genuinely grateful to Bishop Chris and his staff and the Southeast Michigan Synod for taking the lion's share in planning this assembly. I am grateful. We are grateful. that you did. I am not particularly grateful for this troublesome text. <laughs> the doctoral student is setting up the former dean. <laughs> for hear what Jesus said. Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, stand up, take your mat, and walk. And ever since Jesus said it, many have made a connection between personal sin, your sins, and disability. In this case, paralysis. Many have concluded that this man's personal sin caused his paralysis. And based on these conclusions, the church, has wrongly concluded that there is a linkage, a connection, a causal relationship between personal sin and disability. That troubles me. I can understand why people want to make that connection, 
Because if indeed personal sin causes disability, then we can continue to protect some theological fallacies like life is fair and everything happens for a reason. More importantly, if personal sin causes disability, we can maintain some control. You see, if I know what the personal sin is that causes disability and I don't commit it, I will be safe. Thankfully, elsewhere in Scripture, Jesus squarely rejects any causal relationship between personal sin and disability. My favorite is in John, where the disciples asked, Rabbi, who sinned this man or his parents that he was born blind? And Jesus answers, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that the works of God might be revealed in him. So I wish, wish Jesus really would not have said, which is easier to say? <laughs> and yet... Is there anything more existentially paralyzing than personal sin? Or coming to terms with how deeply we participate in systemic sin, like racism. When we know our sin, when we've committed sin, and we know that our sin is known by others, there's no going back. And we can only move forward in fear. We are stuck, reduced to lying helpless on our mats. And even when we know we need to come to Jesus, we don't know how to come to Jesus. Or we don't have the strength to come to Jesus. Or we don't have the faith to come to Jesus. I believe that by my own strength and understanding, I cannot believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to Him. We Lutherans are fond of saying. And as we lay there trying to talk ourselves into trying to come to Jesus, we look over and the way is blocked like the door in a house at Capernaum. It's blocked by other people's needs, which seems more <laughs> urgent. It's blocked by righteous declarations that we are undeserving. After all, we Lutherans have standards. <laughs> it is blocked by, our, by the pain and the brokenness we've caused. It is blocked by our own guilt and shame. It's just impossible to dig through all that stuff. It's too hard. It's too humiliating. Better to stay put on our mats. Jesus won't leave us lying there. Jesus just won't leave us lying there. Then some people came bringing to Jesus one who was paralyzed, carried by four of them. These four friends took the initiative and brought this paralyzed one to Jesus to forgiveness, or at least for healing. And when they found the way blocked, they made another way. They removed the roof above him, and having dug 
Through it, they let down the mat on which the paralyzed man laid. On our best days, there's an image for the church, particularly the Lutheran church. A group of friends bringing people paralyzed by sin, carrying people paralyzed by sin to Jesus for forgiveness and healing. And when we find the way blocked, we make another way. Sometimes we call that reformation. And so some of our friends think we need to make a way around the font to the table. Some of our friends think that we need to make a way around the seminary to mission. Some of our friends think that we need to make a way around structure to mission. Some of our friends think that we need to make a way around the former things and the things of old to the new thing that God is doing. Even now it springs forth, Isaiah says, do you not perceive it? But outside the church, out in the world, too many think we need to make a way around the church to Jesus. <clears throat> Ask people the first word that comes to mind when they hear the word Christian, and their answer is judgment. How quickly we can name all the reasons that we cannot and ought not forgive. The pain is too deep. The consequences are too severe. The brokenness is irreparable. How do we know that people are truly remorseful and repentant and seeking to make restitution? What if it's all a ploy to get back what they lost? Damage control. How quickly we slip into assessments. Ask people outside the church the first word that comes to mind when they hear the word Christian and too many respond. Judgment. Jesus doesn't judge. Child, Jesus says, using a term of affection, your sins are forgiven. And so that we may know that our sins are forgiven. Jesus says it. What's easier to say your sins are forgiven. Or stand up. Take your mat and walk. And the man stands up. Takes his mat and walks. Jesus word. Is confirmed by his deeds. Child. Your sins are forgiven. Some of the Pharisees sitting there, they think that Jesus' statement, his declaration is blasphemy. Because only God can forgive sins. And they have failed to make the real connection that Jesus is God among us. And in the church today, some find that Jesus' statement, his declaration of forgiveness is blasphemy. Because it's too quick and too easy, it makes grace cheap. My friends, grace isn't cheap. Grace is free. Amen. You see, God has already done the judging. God has judged that the pain is too severe. 
that the consequences run too deep, that the brokenness is irreparable. Open the scriptures and you will find God declaring that we are not remorseful, remorseful, repentant, and seeking to make restitution. We don't even really care about the relationship we have lost with God, let alone are we trying to get it back. And moved by pure grace, God breaks open the roof of our world and lowers a baby into a manger. God lowers God very self to eat with outcasts and sinners. And when we nail Jesus to the tree, God lowered a crucified Christ into the tomb. And when Jesus stood up from the mat of death, he brought all of us. He brought the whole world. He brought all creation with him. And now on this side of the resurrection, when we find ourselves helpless on our mats, Jesus sends friends to bring us, to carry us to Jesus for forgiveness, for healing, restored relationship, and new life. Who are the friends that carried that one who is paralyzed to Jesus? Some scholars think it was none other than Simon and Andrew, James and John. You see, Jesus had called them off their boat-shaped mats into new life. They went home to Peter's house, and they saw Jesus heal Peter's mother-in-law. They witnessed as the whole town was gathered about the door, and Jesus cured many who were sick with various diseases, and healed many sicknesses, and cast out many demons. So perhaps Simon and Andrew's, James and John's first act of discipleship was to bring a friend with paralysis to Jesus for forgiveness and healing. Who are those friends? We don't know. Hard to tell in the crowd. But we know this. They may not be the friends you want. They may not be the friends you expect. The friends are coming to carry you to Jesus for forgiveness and healing, restored relationship, and new life. Friends are coming to carry you to Jesus, and it's fun. It's humbling. Maybe it's alarming to think that Jesus might be sending them. Truth be told, he is. But because whoever those friends are, chances are they've spent time on mats of their own. And Jesus brought, sent friends to them who brought them to Jesus, and they stood up, and now they are only participating in what they experienced in Christ. Friends are coming. Who are the friends? We don't know. You see, grace isn't cheap. Grace is free. Amen. Standing up from the mat, that's costly. Standing up from the mat is hard. Mark tells us that he stood up and immediately took his mat and went home. Yeah, I wonder about when the skip wore out of his step. <laughs> you see, that man will walk every step of the journey, shaped by his time on the mats and whatever sins Jesus forgave. And so we as Christians, so we as the church, Take every step, 
take every step shaped by our time on the mat. The sins we've committed and the sinfulness we've observed. And sometimes it's just too hard. It's easier to stay put on our mats or to scream blasphemy because the forgiveness of Jesus can't be that big and real. And so Jesus sends us four more friends. Word, water, bread, bread, and wine. These friends confirm for the church that Jesus' blasphemous forgiveness is real. These friends carry the church to Jesus for forgiveness and healing. These friends free the church to stand up and to bring people paralyzed by sin to Jesus for forgiveness and healing. So whether you're in a part of Christ's church that's stuck on the mat or that's doing the heavy lifting or that's struggling with how big and real Jesus' forgiveness really is, know this. Our Lord is in this house speaking the word to you given and shed for you. Your sins are forgiven. Stand up. Take your mat. Walk. Amen. Amen.